Hey everyone, my name is Colt. Welcome to day one of a yet to be named course. You probably see a name in front of you, but I haven't yet decided on a name. So whatever this is called, I'm gonna try and teach you how to code from the very basics. Uh, you can be a complete beginner. I've never touched a line of code in your life. That's kind of what I specialize in. I don't wanna do a whole blurb bio thing, uh, but in 10 seconds, here we go. I teach people how to code in person at boot camps. I teach courses online. My students work at companies like Google, Airbnb, Apple, Amazon, pretty much all the big tech companies these days. Uh, they have their own companies, they've launched their own apps, and that's enough of the self-promotion. Uh, basically, I just want you to know that I've taught this stuff before and I'm excited to try and teach whoever you are, um, whatever your experience level is, doing this for free online. Today, we're starting from square one. We need to talk about how the web works. Uh, that will be the first half of this video. This one's kind of long. I wanted to try and keep these shorter, but I did want to make sure that we actually wrote some code today and that it wasn't just a conceptual overview. So we're going to start with a high level sort of big picture of how the web works and what HTML, CSS, JavaScript, front end, back end, uh, HTTP requests, what all that stuff means. And then we'll dive into HTML. By the end, you'll be writing some basic HTML. I'll give you some homework if you choose to do any of it. I obviously recommend that you do. It's where most of your learning will take place. Watching me code is, eh, you'll learn something hopefully, but most of it will come from you actually doing stuff. And then tomorrow we'll pick up and continue with HTML and then eventually CSS and onwards. Before we actually begin, um, I'd like to ask you to share this with anybody you think uh, might be interested in learning to code. I don't care if they're your grandma or if they're your son or your daughter. I'm making this course free. I'm hoping that we can build a bit of a community here wherever you are, whether you are on lockdown or sheltering in place like me um, or things are completely normal. Things are a little weird in at least a lot of the world right now. And I'd love to bring in anybody who has a remote interest in coding. Anyway, if there's anyone that you feel like uh, might care about this or might be interested, please consider sharing. Um, I promise right now I will not be marketing or pitching my courses, my boot camps. I'm trying to keep this completely open, free on YouTube, um, and would like to reach as many people as possible. So let's get started now. I hate this first part of every YouTube video. It takes forever to get going, but here we are. We will get started right now. So one of the most frustrating parts of trying to learn to code is figuring out where the heck you start. Whatever you're interested in building at the end, whether it's iPhone games or Android apps or web applications, you have some social network or a startup idea, or maybe you wanna write software for vacuum cleaners. Whatever your goal is, there are so many different languages, choices that you could make, different frameworks, different libraries, different pieces of terminology that you may or may not understand at this point. It can be a little bit overwhelming, especially when you try and get help and there are a million resources telling you, definitely learn this. Whatever you do, do not learn this. You can be pulled in a lot of directions. And the truth is that in the world of programming, there are lots and lots of these tools and technologies that are interconnected. Kind of, I mean, this is not a real diagram of, of programming languages or anything, but you can think of it as something like this massive web of languages and tools and different things that you might want to know. And they're all interconnected and it is overwhelming. But don't fret. Um, we have a nice path. We have a way to untangle this mess of Christmas lights that somehow always get tangled, even though they're just sitting in your garage in a box untouched for an entire year. They go in untangled, they come out tangled. But we're gonna begin by finding the end of that strand. Now that I think of it, I'm not sure if that's even a, a good way of untangling Christmas lights, but that's our strategy. Find a starting point, uh, something that we can cling on to and then grow from there. And in the world of web development, that end of the strand of Christmas lights is HTTP requests. We're gonna to have to talk at a pretty high level to start about a very important central concept to everything on the web, which is HTTP requests. So we'll spend a couple minutes on this and then we'll actually move on to writing some code and talking about HTML and all that fun stuff. So you may or may not have come across the term HTTP before. You may have typed it or seen it in a URL in your nav bar. It stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And it's important because it is the foundation of all communication on the World Wide Web. Every single web page you have ever viewed with your own eyes, whether it's uh, on your laptop or home computer, on your phone, on an iPad, some video game console, wherever you are viewing content, if you are viewing a web page, behind all of it are HTTP requests. 
So HTTP is a protocol. It's a standard or a set of rules for how your browser or how any machine can communicate to another machine by requesting a resource. I would like this web page and then hopefully getting a response back. So you'll often hear the term request response cycle. It's referring to sending a request like hitting enter in the nav bar or clicking a link. I am actually generating an HTTP request every time I do that. It doesn't matter really what it looks like, uh, but there is a standard. You can kind of think of when you send an email, whatever client you're using, whether it's Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail or the iPhone app for mail or it's some other app on your phone, they all look different. They have different colors and interfaces and button names or text and icons, but the format of every email is the same. You've got to have at least one person you're sending it to. You have optionally CC and BCC. Um, there's a subject, then there's a body of the email. Every single email follows that pattern. That is kind of the same idea as HTTP requests. We're not sending an email to somebody, but we are sending a request to a particular server for a particular web page, a resource. And every request has to include some information. We're not really going to go into what it is. We don't need to be able to write the request. Our browser does it for us. For example, I click on this link. I am sending a request. Or if we head over to these slides here, if we click on the Google search button, if I'm searching for silky chickens, it's a breed of chickens that I've been raising. They're quite funny looking. When I click that button, my browser generates a request. It is asking, sending a request to Google or one of Google's servers, asking for the page that has silky chickens as the results. And we haven't talked about servers, but a server is just a computer that is able to listen for incoming requests and then respond with something. So it's just a machine. It could be a laptop like what I'm working on right now. But usually, at least for big companies, it's uh, there are many, many servers and they're all very expensive, dedicated machines that don't look anything like a, a home computer, but they are just computers. So it's a computer connected to the Internet that is able to receive my request. How my request gets there is for another day. It's a very interesting, very complicated topic involving electrons moving down a little piece of wire, essentially, that somehow magically make it to the correct server across the entire world. There are millions and millions of different machines that I could be requesting. Somehow, when I click Google search here, my little electron signal is making it to Google's server, but we're not going to worry about that. Anyway, Google receives my request, and it needs to figure out what to respond with. That is the job of these search servers for Google. Or if I'm requesting Facebook or Wikipedia, their servers need to figure out what I'm asking for based off of the URL. So it will put together a response for me and send it back to my browser. And my browser's job then is to render the content so that it makes sense to me. It's going to render a bunch of code that looks nothing like a web page and turn it into a web page that my eyes hopefully can make sense of. It has images, it has text, all that stuff. So just to reiterate this, whenever I click a link, if I click on this Lepidoptera link, I am sending a request. And it happens very quickly, but that request got a corresponding response from Wikipedia, including the information about Lepidoptera, which is butterflies, or butterflies and moths, I guess. Um, when I type a URL in here and I hit enter, I'm also sending a request. If I have a bookmark in some folder and I click that bookmark, I am sending a request. So there are other ways of sending a request, but those are the most common. You click a link, you type something in the nav bar, you hit enter, that sends a request. A server somewhere is going to look at what you're requesting and then figure out what to send back to you. So this is why if I try and go to some page that probably doesn't exist, I do get a response, but it's a response that says we don't have anything that matches that. Or if I go to google.com and then type some random stuff, I hit enter. You've probably seen pages like this before. 404, that's an error. This is the server's way of telling me, I did get a request, but I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have that page. I can't give you anything except an error page. Now I'm going to go out on a, a little bit of a limb here um, and show you something that you really don't need to know, but it might help clarify how this all works. I can prove to you that there's a request going on. Um, I am using Chrome as my browser. We will talk about what browser I recommend you use and text editor and different tools uh, later on in this video. I'm using Chrome 
And in Chrome, I can open up a set of developer tools. These are tools that if you've never written code or never uh, been a developer or taken a course, you may not know exist. Don't worry about how you open them. Um, this is more of just a demo. There's a tab here called Network. And this is going to show requests that are initiated by my browser. So as, if I leave this open and I click on a link, how about we go to Emperor Moths? I'm going to click there and you'll see a new entry appear. And this is indicating that there was a request made. And I can look at this request if I open it up, move this over a bit, you can see that there are some pieces of information. The URL I was requesting. Other things like this remote address, this referrer policy, don't worry about it. Just think of it as kind of what I mentioned with an email. Every email has a format. You've got to have a to, you've got to have a from, a subject, a body. Same idea. This is the protocol. This is part of the protocol at least. And then there is a response. And this response that came back looks like this. This is what I got back from Wikipedia servers when I requested wiki slash Saturn, Saturnia moth. This is what I got back. It looks nothing like what I see, but this is exactly what the browser uses to generate this web page. So this is all HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. These three little things in the box here. The web page itself is not sent back to me in that response, fully assembled. It's not sent back as like a, an image or something that looks like a web page. It is sent back all as text. And you can actually see this another way. If you go to any web page, let's look at Rotten Tomatoes here. And in Chrome, I can right click view page source. In other browsers, Firefox, Safari, Internet Explorer, you can do the same thing. It might be somewhere else. It might not be called view page source, but I wouldn't worry about it right now. What I can see here is the underlying code that was sent back from Rotten Tomatoes servers to my browser. Then my browser got to work rendering all of this. It knows how to make sense of this and turn it into what we see right here. So every web page you've ever seen has an underlying source that is not very nice to look at. It's just text. And the job of a browser, its main responsibility really, is to render these three technologies, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, into a web page that we can actually understand and look at that is made for human eyes. I kind of like to think of it uh, in terms of shopping at Ikea. You go to Ikea, if you've ever been or if you've ordered something online, the furniture does not come finished. It's not really furniture by the time it makes it to you or you put it in your car, you get it home. It's a set of materials, the wood, the plastic most of the time, um, little rubber feet, the screws, and the instruction manual. And then your job is to assemble that and turn it into something once, it, once it's at your house. And hopefully you don't screw it up and uh, get in your bed and have the whole thing collapse under your weights, which may or may not have happened to me before. That's kind of what your browser is doing. A request is sent from the browser. Hello, I would like this web page for butterflies on Wikipedia or Rotten Tomatoes. The server sends back the IKEA instruction manual. It's not sending back the finished box or the finished bookcase. Your browser gets those instructions and turns it into the actual piece of furniture. I don't know, it's kind of a, a stretch there for that metaphor, but, but maybe it helps, I'm not sure. Next up, there are two important terms that we'll be talking about and you may have heard before, front end and back end. You may have heard front-end developer, back-end developer. Also, um, alternatively, instead of front-end, you might hear client-side, and instead of back-end, you might hear server-side. These are terms that refer to different parts or different areas of development in that request response cycle. So here's another analogy, maybe going on a limb again. Imagine going to a restaurant, you order something, you sit down, you order, I don't know, lasagna uh, or gnocchi with pesto. When you make that order, you are requesting something. And let's say that a server writes down your order and takes it back to the kitchen. And the kitchen is going to receive that request. It's going to assemble or chefs and people in the kitchen will assemble the meal, take the ingredients, put them together into some sort of dish and then send it back to your table. In this context of a restaurant, the kitchen is the back end or server side. The dining room, the table you're sitting at is the front end. So now if we move to another diagram, on the left side we've got front end and on the right side we've got back end. The front end is everything that happens in your browser. So you send a request, that's initiated on the front end or the client side. We, we are the clients or the browser is the client. Then that request is going to make it, in this case, to Google's server. 
and Google and all that logic, all the server side stuff is on the back end. And in the case of Google, there's a lot of work that goes into compiling your web page that is an eventually sent back, right? You have to take, or they have to take your search term, um, look across billions of web pages, figure out which ones match silky chickens in this case, and then order them somehow, figure out how many pages they need, what goes on the first page, insert a million bajillion ads all over the place and try and get you to click those ads. They're going to figure out if you're logged in and if you are, they're gonna put your your, I don't know, your username in the top right. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen. So that logic, that code that is running on the backend, on the server, is what we refer to as backend code or backend development. Um, we're not gonna start with any backend stuff. We are going to be focusing on the content that comes back to the client side or to the front end, which is only, it's always limited to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The only three technologies that your browser knows how to work with. And there's a lot that we can do with those three things, but there's this whole other world on the right side of this dotted line, the code that runs on a server somewhere. And there are many, many other options for languages and tools you can use. You can write backend code or server side code in lots of languages, Python, Ruby, C, Java, which is not at all the same as JavaScript. It's very confusing. Um, lots of languages, a lot more freedom. In the browser, it's easy. Not that the code is easy, but it's easy. You've only got one option, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I guess three options, but they all work together. And for most of the pages, the web apps that I spend my time visiting, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen on that right side of the line in order to make the page for me. Something like Rotten Tomatoes, right? This is a dynamic page, depending on what day you visit, um, or even when in the day you visit, you might get different results. You get different movies showing up here, right? This is not always exactly the same. It would kind of be a useless website if that were the case. And for new movies, as reviews come in for those movies, the page for that movie updates. So there might be new reviews in a couple hours for some movie. So it's not the same page every single time. That page is compiled or built on Rotten Tomatoes computer somewhere, on a server somewhere. And when I'm requesting it, it has to do some work to figure out what I want and figure out you know, what the scores are and what the latest reviews are, or something like um, going to a news site or going to Reddit or Facebook or any social network. There's work that has to be done. Your Facebook homepage is very different than mine. You have different friends, you have different photos and all that other stuff. The server has to build that for you. So this kitchen restaurant metaphor kind of works, but it's, it's a little bit incomplete because at most restaurants, you order something, you make your request for the lasagna, the kitchen builds it, that's the back end, and then the meal just comes back to you already prepared and you eat it, right? You don't have to do any work uh, at your table most of the time. And that's where this metaphor falters a bit. It's really more like this. If you've ever been to a restaurant or a pizza parlor where you can pick up um, a pizza that is not cooked, that you take home and cook, it's kind of like that. So the back end is building the pizza, putting the toppings on, assembling it, putting it in a box. And then the front end logic is putting that pizza in the oven, maybe cutting it up, uh, I don't know, putting Parmesan on top, slicing it, serving it. There's still work to be done. And that's true of most web applications. You make a request, the server does some work to build the web page, sends it back, but it's just code. It's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And the job of your browser is to turn that into something that looks like a web page. And a lot of the time, there is code that continues to run in the browser. So it's not about just making something visual that you can look at that is static. A lot of websites in today's world um, have a lot of code in JavaScript that makes the website interactive, that is going to update the web page as you browse it. You get you know new notifications on Facebook chat, they pop up, you don't have to refresh the page. That's all stuff that is happening on the front end. So that's why maybe this is slightly closer to reality rather than a typical restaurant model because you are not being served a complete meal or your browser doesn't get the complete meal most of the time. There's still work to be done. Okay. So the back end or a server somewhere responds to your request with a response, and that response will include typically HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now let's talk about what those three things are. Why are they there? What do they do? How are they different? This is really where we'll be spending the bulk of our time um, for the next couple days, at least, understanding the basics of HTML and CSS, and then more time trying to understand the basics of JavaScript. It's a little bit bigger of a topic. 
So these are the three and the only three technologies that your browser knows how to run. So let's start with yet another metaphor here. I like to explain these three tools um, in terms of grammar. So we've got this sentence here, the huge carrot danced. As you can see on the right hand side, there's a huge carrot dancing. So HTML, which is the first thing we're going to talk about and focus on in this video and a little bit more tomorrow. HTML is the nouns of a web page. It is the stuff, the structure, the underlying structure. Put an image here, put a, uh, a heading here, put a form here. But it is not the style. CSS is the style. CSS in a sentence would be the adjective, so the huge carrot or the purple carrot or the um, striped carrot whatever, the rotten carrot, that would be the CSS describing the existing HTML, uh, describing the nouns. So CSS is what we use to change how things look, to change the layout, the colors. And then JavaScript is the hardest one to describe here. In a sentence, I would say JavaScript is the verb, so the action. JavaScript is what we use to add interaction to a web page to make it respond to what you do to make it respond to uh, you typing or, or to you clicking um, or to fetch new data live stock prices, for example, um, which I'm trying not to think about at the moment, maybe fetching uh, you know, notifications or receiving notifications when somebody chats you or sends you a message, you get a little pop-up that says, here's a new message, right? Or here's a new email that has appeared while you've been on the same web page. that's all JavaScript. So it might be easier to understand if I show you an example of the three things working in conjunction. So don't worry about any of this code here. Don't worry about understanding a single lick of it. I'm on a web page called CodePen, or it's an application called CodePen.io. It's a place where people can share their own little pieces of a website, their own um, things that they've made. So here's a form somebody made and they've shared it. And I can copy it and play with it. It's all in the browser. I can download the code. Anyway. You don't need to follow along with this if you don't want to, but it's kind of a cool website. And on CodePen, I have three separate windows, an HTML window, a CSS window, and a JavaScript window. And then down at the bottom, at least by default at the bottom, is the rendered view, what we actually see when these three things work together and the browser runs them and renders something. So we've got a form, and this form looks pretty nice, right? There's different colors and fonts. Uh, the spacing is nice. We've got a little hover effect. And when I click here, we get a whole different form. So this is a, a login form if you already have an account. If I click, we get a register form, a different color, there's some nice animations. This interaction here, that is all coming from JavaScript. So if I close that or just delete it, and I have to wait a moment for CodePen to catch up with me down here, you'll see that now when I click, I'm trying to click, nothing happens. So JavaScript is that action, the logic that runs in response to something I'm doing here. Then we've got CSS, um, which is going to be quite dramatic when I remove this. CSS are the adjectives, the styles of this page. If I delete that, oh boy. All right, well, we've got the same content here, believe it or not. We still have the text login. We still have a link. We still have a button that says go. We have our username input to type a username. We have a password input to type a password. They just look horrible. Here's one more example um, to try and explain JavaScript a little bit better. So something like clicking on a button to show and hide a form doesn't seem that crazy or that complicated, maybe. Going back to Rotten Tomatoes, um, one of the simplest things here is this little carousel that slides and I can show and hide content. But we've also got this input here, which is a live search. And as I type, if I look for my favorite movie of all time, Amadeus, I'm getting results here. Um, and new stuff showing up that was not on the page before. This is all thanks to JavaScript. Every time I type something in here, if I look at, uh, what's another good movie I like? How about Captain Fantastic? As I type here, I'm getting new results. This is reasonably complex. There is JavaScript listening to what I'm typing and then figuring out matching movies and finding the information. It actually has to send its own HTTP requests to accomplish this. That's beyond the scope of this video. Um, but long story short, JavaScript plays a very important role on modern web pages. And now we'll embark on our own little journey to try and understand HTML in more depth, or to really understand it at all, and be able to write some of it. So HTML is obviously very important. It is the structure of a page. So yes, the styles are crucial to make something look good and have people want to use it. 
but you've got to know HTML in order to have something to describe, something to style. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Let's focus on that ML, Markup Language. Think of um, if you ever had any uh, papers marked up in middle school or high school or college where you would have some text that you wrote and then a professor, a teacher would mark it up in some way, circling things or underlining or crossing out or writing notes in the margins. HTML is kind of like that, except we're not writing notes about, you know, this is spelled wrong or this is poorly written or you plagiarize this and you're a thief and you need to speak to me and the principal after class. Instead, we are marking up a document to encode or describe the structure of a document. HTML originally um, arose out of the need for sharing research papers between universities. So research papers have a format, right? There's a lot of text in there. Some of them are quite long. And there's a format where there's, you know, an abstract and different paragraphs of text. There's citations and links within them and footnotes. There are headers and italicized text and uh, bold text. But underlying it all is just information. It's just text, right? If we took this paper on the right-hand side that you're looking at and we made everything the same font size, we made everything the same font weight, uh, we removed all spacing, it would just be a chunk of text. And the job of HTML is to through more text, be able to describe what is what. We're trying to encode or add structure. So I could say, this is supposed to be a paragraph of text. This is supposed to be a header, the main header. This should be italicized. This should be a much smaller header. It should be bolded. That's what HTML allows us to do. And remember that every single thing um, that you ever view in a browser, every web page, whatever it is, is all just sent as text as part of a HTTP response that we get from a server. So it's just text and that information about the structure has to be encoded in text. So imagine trying to describe this structure to somebody over the phone or even better through Morse code, little beeps and bloops, what is it, dots and dashes, flashing a light across your city to, or across your street to some neighbor in the, in the apartment next door. How would you describe each chunk of text and designate what is italicized and what's bold and what's regular font. Just to show you what I mean, um, I've extracted the underlying text from this Wikipedia page, not the entire thing, but the first little chunk and I think this sidebar over here. So I've had, I have all the words, the text extracted from this page. And what I like to do with my students uh, in person is ask them actually to spend like five or 10 minutes with a partner trying to figure out the best way to include information about what is the page header and what is uh, italicized and what is a standalone paragraph. How would you do that? And I've seen a lot of approaches from students ranging from things like, you know, main header colon and then something like that. So that would be our main header here. Saturn, Saturnid day, Saturnid I don't speak, or I never took Latin, sorry. And then we've got this, which maybe is like a, what would you call that a subheader from wikipedia the free encyclopedia so then maybe you could do something like a subheader and indent this or i've seen people use arrows i mean there's a lot of things you could come up with but at the end of the day what we're doing is marking up this document to try and specify this is italicized this is bolded this is the header and this approach here might have worked, but the reality of most web pages and most documents is that we'll have things maybe that are bolded inside of a paragraph of text. We might have things that are links inside of a paragraph of text or a citation. So if we took this one thing, it goes from Saturnidae all the way to giant silk moths. Where is that? Uh, ooh, where are you? Here we go. I think it's this. This line down to this right here. If I were to try and explain that this is a standalone paragraph, I could do, you know, paragraph of text and then indicate that this is a paragraph of text. You can see that there's a space on either side or an empty line here and there. But then this is supposed to be bolded. So how am I going to say that that's bolded? I could do bolded, maybe put that there and then have this not be bolded. Anyway, this is not HTML, so I'm not going to spend much longer theorizing this fake system. But HTML accomplishes the same thing at the end of the day, but it uses a different strategy. Instead of typing paragraph of text colon and indenting stuff, 
we use HTML tags and elements, which is what we're about to see. Now, before we go any further, when we actually start typing some code, um, there are two tools that I recommend that you install. You definitely don't have to. Both of them are free um, and they are trusted, used by millions of people. There's nothing sketchy about them. One is a web browser, Chrome. It's what I use. Um, and I'm not recommending that you use it just because I use it. It's pretty standard across the web development community. It's free. Um, and then second of all, we've got an editor, a text editor, where I'll be writing my code, whether it's HTML or CSS or JavaScript or something else. I use VS Code, which is a free text editor. Um, you can write code in any sort of text editor. You could use text edit or text wrangler or whatever the, uh, the uh, text editor is that comes with your operating system. But a code editor like VS Code comes with a lot more features. So this is what VS Code looks like. Once we start writing HTML, you'll see that it highlights our HTML nicer. It gives, it gives us some autocomplete. Um, it will let us know if something's wrong. And there's a lot of stuff that VS Code does once you get into JavaScript and other programming languages. Um, so it's worth installing. It's free. Uh, you can customize it. If you do want to learn more about customizing it, I have a video on how you can change colors and fonts and set different preferences. But really, for the next couple minutes and for today, tomorrow, all you really need is a place to write code, to write HTML. And I recommend you use VS Code and then a place to run that code, which is a browser. We need a browser to render our HTML, as we've already described. That's the whole point of a browser, or that's at least the main responsibility. A browser takes HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and turns it into something we can see. So go ahead and install these two if you don't have them. I'll include links in the description, right to the download page. Make sure you're downloading you know, a Mac version or a PC version, depending on your machine. And if you're bored or tired, exhausted, um, maybe this is a good place to take a quick break because we're about to start doing something a bit more um, interactive where, where you'll be writing more code and maybe following along and I don't know, maybe get some coffee or tea or something. All right, so let's begin with HTML. HTML is really just a collection or a set of standard elements that browsers know what to do with. They recognize and they can figure out oh, this is supposed to be an image or this is a link or a paragraph. So there's a set of these elements that we can use, for example, a P element is how we make a paragraph of text. IMG is how we make an image element. And you can see a full list of these elements on a web page called Mozilla Developer Network, MDN for short. Um, it provides documentation or, or multiple guides and references for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And one of those pages is called the HTML Elements Reference. I'll include it in the description of this video as well. And if I scroll down, you'll see that we have a bunch of different elements. Each one of these is an element. So we have things like navs or uh, paragraphs here. We've got things to represent a citation. Um, what else in here? Uh, a link, images. There's ways to add video or an audio element. So there's a good amount of elements, um, but really I'd say maybe 25 of them are super commonly used and then the rest are um, not that they're useless they're just much more niche you're not going to need uh, to master most of these elements here so don't freak out when you see how many there are there really aren't that many that you need to know and we'll go over the ones that are most important today and then tomorrow we'll talk more all right so that's the concept of an element but to actually use one or to write html in a document we write what are called tags. So an element consists usually of an opening and closing tag, two different tags. You can see them here. We've got an opening tag. In this case, for a paragraph element, we need an opening tag and a closing tag. This is a typical pattern. So these angle brackets around the tag name, P, and then the same thing on the right-hand side after some text, but with a forward slash here to indicate that we are ending the paragraph. So this just tells the browser, this is a paragraph starting here and stopping here. Very short paragraph, but it is valid. We will see a couple elements that do not consist of an opening and closing tag, but most of them do. So why don't we try writing some really basic elements? What we need to do is open up VS Code. If that's the editor that you'll use, which is the one I'm using, I recommend you use it if you're brand new. And I'm going to make a new file in here so I can do file new, I can use a shortcut, command N, 
and it makes me an empty file. But the first thing I want to do is actually indicate that this is an HTML file. And that means it needs to end with the extension .html, just like .dot, uh, what is it, .doc for a Word document or .dot PDF. In this case, it should be called something .html. It does not matter what you name it; you should give it something that makes sense. I, I recommend not putting a space in your name or in the file name. So I'll do something like my first page .dot html. Just that extension that's most important. Okay. So I have a .html file, and now I'm going to write my very first HTML element. We're going to start with one called an H1. An H1 is a heading. It is the largest heading on a page, and we write it like this here. You can see that I got this autocomplete already. That's one of the reasons we use a text editor like VS Code, so it knows I'm typing HTML because it's a .html file. I can type things like H1, and if I close that bracket there. It gives me the corresponding closing tag. So in here, I can write some content. So、um, if I wanted to mimic what we had from this Wikipedia page, the header of my page here will be Saturn Saturnidae Saturnidae,、um, and then I'm just going to put some other text down here so you can just see the difference. And I'm going to save. So I use a shortcut Command S. You can just do File Save. And now we need to run this or open it in a browser. To do that, there are a couple of options. If you just navigate to the file, wherever you save that file, I put mine in a folder. I called it YouTube Course. I can double click or I can right click, open with Google Chrome, or if I just double click, Chrome is my default browser, and it opens up, and I see my rendered content. So right away, we can see that the header here, that H1 Saturnidae, is much much larger than the rest of our text here. And that's because we wrapped it in the opening H1 tag and the closing H1 tag. So we need that opening and we need that closing. If I move that closing, we're now indicating that all of this is supposed to be our big header. And I will have to refresh the page in order to get a change. And we can see, oh, it did change. Now we've got a very large header that makes no sense. Not that Saturnidae, Saturnidae makes much sense either, if, unless you understand Latin. Anyway. Poor choice on my part to use that web page,、um, but we have written our first element, and we've got it to display in the browser. If you make a change, remember you need to refresh. I like to use a shortcut, just Command R in a Mac.、Um, you can open your HTML file in a non-Chrome browser. You can do it in Safari, Firefox,、uh, Internet Explorer. Another option is to go to File and then Open File and navigate to your file, and it will open up in your browser as well. You can also drag the file down to the、uh, dock or to the icon for Chrome, or you can drag it into the browser. However, you do it, you just want to make sure you see something like this. If you're following along, do not feel like you need to type the same text. You could make your own page, put some animal here that you're interested in, or that you like, or a book, or anything. Now we're going to move on to a couple other elements. So H1 is supposed to be the Most important heading on your page, but we actually have multiple levels of headings. We have H2s, so I'll just put I am an H2 here, and then we have an H3. We have all the way down to an H6. Another option for making a new element in VS Code is to type H4 without even writing those brackets and hitting Tab, and it will expand into the correct opening and closing tags. So I'm just going to write some H4, H5, and H6s. And save. I'm going to refresh my page, and you'll see that we have different levels of headings, different sizes of text. Now, the size is not important. This is something we can change with CSS. I could make this one massive. I could make this one tiny. That's not what we're doing. We're simply saying that this is the main header of a page, and this would be a subheader. So, in the example of Wikipedia, we've got our main header here, the most important topic on the page, and then down here we've got Smaller pieces, distribution, life cycle, and then within life cycle, if these were H2s, we might have an H3 here and and here, and then this would be back to an H2. So they are indicating the structure of the information, not the size or the display properties of that actual piece of text or that header. Okay, so that's an H1 down to an H6. I'm going to get rid of that. The next element we'll take a look at is a paragraph. So a paragraph is made with a tag called p. 
So I have this big block of text, and if I put it in here, VS Code tries to format it for me and put spaces in there, but what you'll see is that the spacing is completely ignored by my browser. I could put as much white space as I want in here, although, ugh, how annoying. Whenever I save, it's going to be undone anyway. But if I put that in there, there's a space here, there's a space here. My browser does not care. I'm refreshing. It ignores that. So to indicate that something is actually a paragraph of text, like if we go to Wikipedia, we take a look again. I think I have all of this text here. There's a separate paragraph for this first line and then a separate paragraph here that goes down to insects alive today. So silk moths and insects alive today. Um, I'm going to just put all of this back, delete it and repaste it in. So it looks like this was our first paragraph. If we're trying to copy this structure and then this is a second one. So all I need to do is wrap it in a tag, an opening P tag, not paragraph the word, but just P. And I'll save and VS Code is, is making the spacing look a little wonky. It's trying to help me read it. Um, don't worry about that. It's going to be ignored by my browser. And if I go back to my page and I refresh, I now have some space. So that's a paragraph. Now a paragraph is not supposed to be used to just add space where you want it. We can space things out with CSS at any point. It is supposed to indicate here is a standalone paragraph of text, which is exactly what this is. So I should add another one here around that paragraph of text. Refresh the page. It doesn't look any different, but it is important to understand that I'm supposed to be declaring this as a paragraph of text. That's what it is. And if I had text that came afterwards, now there would be a little bit of space here. But again, we can change that spacing whenever we want. Next up, let's cover some more important elements. Um, why don't we start with adding links? So this Wikipedia page, let me close down some of this stuff. We don't need all of this. Get rid of you. Sorry. And go back to this. There's lots of links on this page, right? And we're not going to recreate all of them. I don't want to waste your time. It's the same process for every single one. We need to use a tag with a very particular name. It is not link. Unfortunately, there actually is a link tag in HTML. It's kind of confusing. It does something completely unrelated to making a hypertext link, um, the traditional link that we would click on here. Instead, we use an element known simply as an A element or an A tag. That's it. So we wrap this A around the text that we want to make a link. So for example, let's do emperor moths. So emperor moths is right here. I'm going to write A instead of my opening tag. And then I'm going to move that and close emperor moths with that forward slash closing tag like that. And if I go back to my browser, I'm not going to notice anything. And that's because a link has an essential piece of information that we did not include. We need to specify where this link goes to, right? You don't just arbitrarily designate this is a link and that's a link and the browser just magically knows where to go. We have to indicate this is a link that goes to Emperor Moss. So this is a link that goes to, what is it? Wikipedia slash insects. But I could also add a link to my social media profile or my, um, I don't know, my YouTube channel. I could add whatever sort of link I want it's just a URL that I specify. And the way that I do it is something we haven't seen yet. We use what's known as an attribute. So an HTML attribute is additional information that we can pass in to a tag. So we usually put it in the opening tag here. After that A, between those braces. And the special name for this attribute for a link is href. I can't even remember what it stands for. Hyper link reference or something like that. And we need to use an equal sign and then opening and closing quotations, quotes. And in here, I am going to add in a link. So I could do something like www.google.com. And this indicates that I want to make a link with the text of Emperor Moths that when clicked, will send a request to www.google.com. So if I go back to my page and I refresh, it now looks like a link right here. Don't worry about the colors or the underlining. You can change that later with CSS. But notice my cursor changes. And if I click this, it's not quite going to work, but it does take me somewhere. I just get an error. This is kind of a complicated thing to explain. Hang in there with me. We are viewing our page on something called the file protocol. If I go to any other web page, 
like this one, Google's 404 page or Wikipedia, I don't see that file. I'm actually on HTTP or HTTPS. Anyway, it is different than the file protocol. What I need to do here to make this link work is indicate explicitly I want HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com. And now if I refresh and I click that link, hey, it took me to Google. So I can't just say google.com like that. If I do that, you'll see that it ends up trying to take me to the current page that I'm on slash google.com, which is relative. It's looking on my machine in my folder called the YouTube course. And this is all stemming from the fact that we are not viewing this web page. Our HTML here is not actually being served to us from a server. It's not coming back as part of a response. We're not visiting it on an actual website or we're not making a request. We're just looking at a local file on our machine. Anyway, that's how we could write a simple link. If I wanted to copy the Wikipedia link for, where, is it? where are you, Emperor Moths here, I could just copy this link or this URL from my navbar, come back here and paste it in there as the href. Now I'll refresh my page again, click on my link, and it takes me right there. So you could take any link. I could take the URL from Rotten Tomatoes, copy that, and make this anchor tag. How about another anchor tag? Um, let's just do it right here. An anchor tag, go to Rotten Tomatoes. Is there an E there? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and we need that href, which again is called an attribute. There are other attributes that we'll see for different elements. For example, to make an image, we have to specify what the image file is that we're trying to display. But for an anchor tag to make a hyperlink, we need href. I will refresh my page. Oh, I need to go back to my actual page. We now have a big link here. It says go to Rotten Tomatoes. I click and it takes me to Rotten Tomatoes. So this is how you could add Instagram and whatever Facebook, Twitter links at the bottom of your web page. Obviously you would style them and probably use fi uh, fancy icons for those social media networks rather than just a piece of text. But underlying that, there's just an anchor tag. So that's an anchor tag. Let's see, next up, we've got a couple more elements I wanna to cover today. Tomorrow we'll be learning more, uh, focusing on uh, some more advanced HTML. One thing that we've already seen in action, although I haven't called out explicitly, is that we can nest elements inside of other elements. So here I have an anchor tag inside of a paragraph. Let me show you a couple other elements. Um, the first one is a B tag which is one way of making something bold. Now it's actually kind of fallen out of style in HTML. It still works, but tomorrow we'll see a, a better way to make something bold or to call something out. But let's look at the Saturnids webpage and let's make this bold like it is on Wikipedia. Or if you're just making your own web page here, find something to bold. Am I miss? I think I copied too much text. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of that. Anyway, to make it bold, I write a B tag and wrap that around whatever I want to be bolded, like that. Now if I refresh the page, it is bolded. I also have um, a similar tag, an I tag, to make something italicized. So let's find some piece of Latin in here. Um, how about this right here, Atticus Atlas. After Atlas Moth, we've got Atticus Atlas, we will italicize that. See if I can find that. Here it is. So to make that italicized, I use my opening I tag, and then the closing I tag goes after the content, the text I want to italicize. I save, I refresh my page, and somewhere in here, there it is, it's now italicized. And as I briefly mentioned, this is not quite the best way to bold or italicize something, but it's the simplest way without me having to explain the shortcomings of it. Uh, we'll leave that for tomorrow. So it does work and you won't get in trouble for using it. Um, next up, let's talk about some other elements that are a little bit different. If we go back to Wikipedia here, you'll see this list right here. This is a numbered list, right? And there's uh, different pieces. It's a table of contents here, but we can have lists of all sorts. For example, here's a bulleted list, different uh, families and subfamilies it looks like of moths. So let's see how we could create our own list. There are a few elements we need to discuss. First of all, um, I'll introduce one called a UL. So the element name is UL. To make one, we use the UL tags. 
However, unlike some of these other elements we've seen, we don't put text directly in here. Instead, we actually add a second element inside, multiple elements, they're called LIs. So I'll explain what these are. A UL stands for unordered list. So it will give us bullet points by default, unordered. And then LIs are the individual list items or list elements. So if I put something in here, like first thing, and then I make another LI, second thing, and I save this file, I refresh my page, I've got my first bulleted list. And if I copy that, and I change it over ever so slightly to be a OL instead of a UL, this means an ordered list, which will be a numbered list by default. And there we go, first thing, second thing. So you can change these styles. You can make this Roman numerals. You can make these little dashes or emojis. They don't have to be the default circles. But the key thing to understand is that a UL, unordered, OL, ordered. And inside of each one, we actually nest further elements, LIs. So LIs are versatile. They can work unordered or ordered. They adapt based off of what their parent is. So if we were trying to create something like a very simple version of this list here, well, maybe we won't do this 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, but I'll show you very briefly that we can do something like this. If I copy this right here, distribution, um, I'll get rid of this and eh, maybe I'll keep it there and I'll just paste this in here. We know that we're going to have an ordered list. So I'll just type OL and hit tab. We're going to have our first LI, which is distribution. And then let's also take importance to humans. So that will be our next LI. Or I guess we've got life cycle. And then one more importance, importance to humans. And if I save, I refresh my page. I now have that list that has three items. This here is my unstructured text that I did not actually wrap in any sort of elements. Um, now what I'd like to do is show you that we can actually nest even further inside of this life cycle, which is what this uh, sub list text corresponds to, right? If we go back here, life cycle, eggs, larva, larvae, pupae, adults, I can create a new ordered list inside of that LI. So it would look something like this. Another UL, or no, OL, we're doing ordered. And then an LI for eggs, another LI for larvae, another LI for pupae, and another LI for adults. Okay, let's see how that looks. I'm gonna refresh my page and there we go. I've got a ordered list with a nested order list, ordered list inside. Now the numbering style is slightly different. As you can see, we're not getting those sub numbers, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. Let's not worry about that, uh, but we do have a nested list. We could also change that to be an unordered list and you'd see it now goes to nested bullet points. If I refresh, there we go. And I could also do things like make each one of these a link, which is what happens on Wikipedia. I'm not going to do that uh, just for the sake of time. I could make them bolded. I could make them italicized. We can mix and match. We can nest things. Uh, we have a lot of flexibility. Now there's one more element we'll see today, which is the image element. It's how I can add an image to my document. And the first thing we'll need to do is find an image we wanna use. Maybe I'll take this image here. So this is coming from Wikipedia. It's already online. It is not an image I have on my machine, but if I just right click, copy image address, or I just copy that address up there, and then I figure out where I want this image in my document, I'll just do it, uh, I'll probably do it at the end because it's gonna be kind of large. We're not gonna style it, we won't change the size. If you have a large image, it's going to display large until we cover CSS. So to make an image, we use an image tag IMG, whoops, IMG. But what's interesting and important to note is that we don't have a closing tag. If you think of an image, there isn't any text to go in between those tags, right? There's nothing to display in terms of text content. Instead, an image tag is something known as a self-closing tag or self-closing element, where we put that closing slash just after image. And if I just did this, I won't see anything. No image that I can find. 
I have to specify what image we want to display. And I have to use another attribute like we did for an anchor tag. We have an href attribute for a image tag. It's slightly different. It's called source src. So what is the source of our image? Same format though equals quotes. You need both of them. And then I'm going to paste in that URL right there. Whoops, right there. Save. I'll refresh my page. And there it is. I see that image showing up right there. So whatever URL I put in here, there should be some image there. And if I put something that you know doesn't exist, it's going to look for that. And I get that little broken thing. You've probably seen this before when an image doesn't load. It might look different in your browser if you're not using Chrome, but same idea. It can't find that image. There is another attribute that we can add called alt, which is alternate text. So in the case that the image does not load, or if somebody is using a screen reader, so um, they're unable to see the image, the alternate text will be read out loud. So we can add a description. Um, I don't even know what was that image that we were looking at. So life cycle. Yeah, let's just go with moth life cycle. And that text will show up if the image can't be found. We see moth life cycle or if somebody's using a screen reader. But if that image does work and I refresh the page, we don't see that text anymore. So we just saw two more attributes source, which is very important for an image and alt, which may not seem that important, but is crucial in terms of making your websites accessible to people who may not be able to see them. Um, so this is something that's a bigger topic we'll return to. But this is our first little taste that alt attribute plays a significant role. All right. So we've seen quite a few tags and elements at this point. Um, eh, maybe not quite a few. What? Seven? Eight? If, if you count all those H, one, two, three, four, five, sixes, then yes, we've seen quite a few. One thing that I'll wrap up with before we uh, actually wrap up is if you have an image locally on your machine. For example, I have an image in the same folder as my HTML file. It is called kitty dash basket dot png. You can also use uh, JPEG images. You can use um, GIFs or GIFs or however you pronounce it. Um, whatever the actual image file is, you need to know that name and you need to know the location. The easiest possible location is in the same file as or in the same folder as your HTML file. If that's the case, I can just do a image and then set the source equal to the exact name of that file, kittybasket.png. And the browser will look for a file with that name directly in the same directory, <laughs> in the same folder. If I refresh, oh, there she is. It's one of my cats. All right. Now, if I had some other folder instead, like a photos, photos folder, and I had a bunch of uh, different photos, I wanted to keep them organized, I could do that. But then I just need to make sure I reflect that here as photos slash kitty dash basket. Refresh the page and it still works. And I should also add an alt attribute, my cute cat. Okay, so you can use local images that you have on your machine or images that are hosted online, both of which you use the source attribute to indicate what that actual image URL is or where the browser can find that image to be displayed. So one thing that we have not talked about that you may have noticed already is the way some elements behave. Some elements are going to live on their entire own line, which is what we would refer to as a block element. So for example, a paragraph or an H1. If I put a paragraph inside of uh, another paragraph, or if I put an H1 in here, which you pretty much would not do, but if you did, Let's put that around this piece of text that also says Saturnids and save. Refresh the page. You'll see that it goes on its very own line, just like this little diagram here. It extends all the way across. We'll learn more about this when we talk about CSS. But this element is basically going all the way over here saying, get out of my way. I need my own space. Some elements are block level. That term block level is referring to those elements that take up a full block. So a paragraph, an H1, H2, all the way down to H6. There are some other elements we'll learn later on. But then other elements are not. We would call them inline elements. So they have no problem fitting alongside other elements. They don't need to kick everything off and have their own space. So I'm going to undo that. 
Uh, but we've already seen inline elements. For example, a bold tag here, that bold line or that bold piece of text is in line with the rest of the content. It doesn't take up its own line. Same thing with a link. Yes, an anchor tag might look like it's on its own line here, but that's just because of how I wrote it. It's in between two paragraphs, so nothing is sharing that space with it. But here we can see an anchor tag. It is not taking up its own space. Now there's one last very important thing that I've been waiting on because it kind of sucks when you're starting out to have to cover this first, but it is very essential. It's called an HTML skeleton or boilerplate. It's another term you'll hear thrown around. Um, basically, every HTML document that we write is supposed to follow a particular format. Ours is not. We are writing our elements in here, but we're actually supposed to work within a bit of a, a skeleton or a framework. And it looks like this right here. So these are some kind of confusing to explain elements that may not seem that useful, but I'll run through them pretty quickly. This first one up here, it's called a doc type. It's indicating basically the version of HTML that we're using. Um, it's not quite as simple as saying a version, uh, but it, it indicates that we're using the most modern HTML. That's all we'll say about it for now. It does not have a closing tag, which is kind of confusing, but it needs to come right at the beginning of our document. Then we have an HTML element that wraps around everything. So what I'm gonna do is cut all of my content. I'm gonna keep it, but just cut it out and start by making this HTML element that goes around everything. And then at the very top, I'm gonna write that doc type. And actually I can never remember how to write this because there's a shortcut I use uh, that I'll show you in just a moment. So we're, we're halfway there, well, not quite, but we're almost there. Then inside of that HTML, Everything that you do will go between that opening HTML and that closing. It's just a way of saying, here is HTML browser. Even though the browser was able to figure it out, we weren't actually following the rules as to how we're supposed to write our code. Then there are two child elements that go inside of that HTML element, head and body. So let's start by just writing them. I'll just use the shortcut. I'll type head and I'll type body tab. Now let's talk about what they do. So the head is where we put meta information about our document. And it's where we eventually will include references to our JavaScript or to our CSS or to other files if we need to load a font. It is not where we actually put the content of the web page. Everything that we've typed so far would go in the body. This is the body of the page. Everything you see, at least on this white part of the page, after this nav bar, everything down here is coming from the body. So I'm gonna paste my code back there that I copied out, all inside the body, just like that. And if we refresh, we won't really see anything different, but now we're following the rules. And if you look at any HTML, any web page, if we look at Rotten Tomatoes, scroll way to the top, this is the underlying source. What do we see? Doc type HTML, HTML, head, and then there's a bunch of stuff in the head, and eventually we will see somewhere on here, we'll see body. I promise. Where are you? <laughs> there it is, body. So one thing that we can put in the head, even though we haven't talked about including uh, CSS or fonts, one thing we can put is a title. And this page title is not the title that you see here. It's actually what you see in the tab in your browser. So it kind of makes sense that it, that it goes in the head because if this is the body, everything rendered um, below our nav bar, the content, this is kind of its own standalone piece. And the way that we write that is inside of that head element, we add a title element, and then whatever your page title is, my first page or my first site or whatever it is. If I refresh, it now says my first site. The basic skeleton here will always be the same. Doc type HTML, HTML, head with a title, and then body with your content. In fact, you do this so often, if I just get rid of all this for a moment, there's a shortcut in most coding editors, VS Code has it. If we type an exclamation point and I hit tab, I get the entire skeleton. Now I also get some other things we have not considered. We have not talked about these meta tags. You can delete them, you can leave them. They're not going to have an impact on the code that you write. But if you compare everything else, we've got doc type, HTML, head, title, body. So you can type it from scratch, which I do recommend you doing at the beginning. Reference this slide like for your homework, if you're gonna follow along with the assignment I'll give you. I recommend doing it and just typing out doc type, HTML, head. But in, in the future, it's kind of a lot to type. 
exclamation point tab in VS Code at least will give you that entire structure. Lastly, here is a bit of a homework assignment. Um, if you would like to try and cement your skills, I definitely recommend doing this. So I'm gonna give you, or I've given you some text uh, that you can download. In the description of this video, you can find um, a link to download this text file. It is not HTML. I would like for you to make an HTML file. You can name it whatever you want. Put this text in there or use this text to mark up. And I'll show you what the end result should look like. You can have a little bit of, of creativity or flexibility here, but um, I would try and recreate exactly what I've done here. So I've got you know a heading here, the biggest heading on the page, uh, some bold text. I've got some paragraphs of text. I've got another heading, but not as big as that one. And these two are the same size. Then I've got a third heading that's smaller than this one. Um, there is a link here. Notice that that link is also italicized. You can make that link go wherever you want. I wouldn't worry about where it actually goes. The bold text here, and then I've got a list with bullet points, and then a nested list, and another nested list, and another nested list, only one bullet in each, and some italicized text, as you can see there, Panthera, Puma, uh, as Akinox, Asinox, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then I've got two images. These images, the URLs, uh, are also included in this document. So you can just copy from there. And that's kind of it. Feel free to add on some more. There's some italicized stuff that I didn't actually uh, italicize, like Panthera right here. That should be italicized. It's uh, Latin, right? Anyway. Do this if you would like. I, I definitely recommend this. If this was a real class in person, um, this would be you know something that you would do for the next 30 minutes-ish, maybe less, maybe longer. Don't feel bad if it takes you longer. Um, there is some wiggle room, obviously, in terms of how you structure things, like which heading specifically you use here, what size. You don't need to worry about getting an exact match. Just make sure that everything is present. So download that text, copy it over to an HTML file, Oh, and make sure you use the valid HTML skeleton that we just talked about. And now we're done. We've covered enough of the basics for one day. It's been kind of a long lecture here, um, especially with the early stuff on HTTP and requests, but we're on our way towards learning HTML. Stay patient. Our sites will not look very nice for a while, uh, but we have to cover these core underlying concepts, the elements, the structure of a page. We know how to make links. We know how to make images um, and lists and headings, paragraphs. We have yet to cover things like forms. Um, how do we make inputs and drop down inputs and uh, things like buttons? We haven't talked about tables. There are other HTML topics that we do need to cover tomorrow, but we've made a pretty good dent.